Microsoft Outlook and give us some tips and tricks about our Outlook inbox. Um, I was talking to Eric Kunin earlier and he was saying um, that zero inbox idea is just um, so far away from <laughs> where he is right now with his inbox. And I, I kind of identify with that. So I'm really hoping you have something for us, Stephanie, that we can walk away with in terms of how we manage our inboxes here at GVSU. So with that, Stephanie, I'm gonna turn it over to you and you have control to present. So please feel free to, uh, to go ahead and do that. And again, thank you for being here and sharing your time with us. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Rick, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm excited to be able to show you guys um, some skills um, that you may or may not have already dabbled in as far as Outlook is concerned. Um, but uh, I'm gonna start just kind of doing a brief introduction. Um, if at any point uh, you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat um, or unmute. Um, I wanna make sure I'm taking the time to um, tailor the training uh, around what you guys need. So I'm gonna share my screen here and hopefully I don't have any technical difficulties. All right, okay. So let me just start really briefly um, by introducing myself. So hi, um, as Rick mentioned, I'm IT training specialist for Grand Valley um, as of June, 2023. Um, and prior to that, uh, I was a K-12 mathemat mathematics educator uh, for the past 10 years. So I was teaching middle school math. So I'm passionate about learning. Um, I'm passionate about my students, no matter what, who they are. Um, and I am really excited to be on this e-learning team and a part of Grand Valley and being able to basically give you what you need as far as Microsoft competencies are concerned. So, all right, moving onward, um, I'm just gonna kind of briefly touch on what Microsoft Outlook is um, in general and what it can do for you. Um, and then we'll move into kind of what I'm gonna cover as far as the objectives and the skills that go along with that. All right, so Microsoft Outlook, I know we use it um, as essentially a system for emailing one another. However, it's way more intricate than that. Um, it's an electronic mail and calendaring application within the Microsoft 365 suite. So it has a lot of capabilities. Um, you really can organize and prioritize your email, um, your appointments, you can schedule, you can create task lists, you can manage, you can share, you can work online, you can work offline, um, really stay productive wherever you are. Um, however, a lot of us don't really know um, the extent to which Microsoft Outlook provides us with all of these capabilities. Um, and sending and receiving emails and scheduling meetings can seem really daunting and time consuming. Um, and as Kyle uh, mentioned, I think if you watch the intro video, um, it he mentioned that studies show that on average, office employees receive as many as 121 emails per day and spend almost around three hours um, on work email. So, you know, that essentially adds up to a substantial amount of time that you could be using more productively elsewhere. Um, so the upside is um, we can save some time. And I'm here to try to help you maybe take away one or two skills that can help your daily efficiency in your workflow. So um, let's talk about what those are. So I'm gonna be covering skills um, related to organizing your messages and managing automatic message content, um, as well as scheduling meetings. So that's kind of what we're gonna be covering. And um, I'll provide you, Rick, with the uh, slide deck upon completion, just so that people have reference. So I wanted to pick skills that were transferable um, across both Windows and um, Mac users. So how I've set this up is um, you'll see on the slide deck, I have a table and the skill listed um, on the far left column. Um, in the center column, I have how Windows users would accomplish this task, and on the far right column, uh, how Mac users would accomplish this task, because depending on your operating system, uh, you might be achieving the same skill with different keystrokes. So I just wanna make that clear. 
I, for this demonstration, will be using um, a Windows PC. So for Windows users, you are welcome to follow along with me. I will also be using the current version of Outlook and not the new Outlook. And I will be using the desktop application. So let's get into it. Um, I'm going to open Outlook. And if you are going to follow along with me, you can access your Outlook desktop application via the start menu, which is this window icon in the lower left corner. So if you click on that, you can then open up Outlook um, for your viewing. So mine looks like this. And many of you might have a toggle in the upper right hand corner that says, Let's try the new Outlook. Mine is toggle to off. Um, we found that with um, Outlook, the current version um, has a lot more capabilities than the, the new version. So we're kind of sticking with that for right now. Um, so I'm going to start off pretty basic with message organization. Um, you guys are familiar with your email inbox, I'm sure, if you've utilized it before in Outlook. Um, but basic skills for organization, adding folders and subfolders. I know many of us tend to let emails build up in our inbox, which can be extremely daunting. Um, we can kind of save a little bit of time if we create a better filing system for ourselves. So adding folders and subfolders is pretty basic. Um, you can see my Outlook email here up at the top. This is my Outlook inbox. Um, but if I wanna create subfolders, all I need to do is right click on either the account and then I can create a new folder and title it. Or if I'm looking for creating subfolders based on specific categories, let's say in my financial insurance folder or credentials folder, I can right click on that folder and click new folder and it will create a subfolder. You know you've created a subfolder when you see this small caret to the left of the title. Now many of you may already know how to do that and that's great. If not, hopefully you can add this to your toolkit. Additionally, something that I have found is helpful are once you've created all of these folders, um, you can change their permissions. So this might be something you haven't done before. So if you click on a folder, what you can right click and you go to properties. So all these folders have specific properties. So right now, if I go under permissions, oops, I'm sorry, not permissions, policies, it's choosing use parent folder policy. So essentially what that means is right now, when I create a folder, anything that I put in that folder will stay there unless I do something to it manually. But I can add or remove retention policies if I so choose. So let's say you have a folder based on a specific semester of student work or student data. And you're like, eh, I wanna file that away, but I don't wanna get rid of it. Well, you could change your retention policies by clicking this and what it's gonna do, it's gonna pull up essentially, and if it allows me to log in, it seems to be having a problem. It allows you to change, it's not allowing me to show you right now, but it allows you, you to change exactly how long those emails exist in that particular folder. So you, it will sign you into the online web version of Outlook when you click this. Um, it doesn't want to with this link currently, but it'll sign you into the online version of Outlook and you'll be able to add retention policies. So if you wanna keep those emails for six months, if you wanna keep them for a year, three months whatsoever, and that way you can change any folder you create to have to having a time limit, kind of like your delete, deleted items folder that has a retention policy after a certain amount of time, it will delete those items in there. So that is something you are able to do when you create folders and subfolders. Something else that I found helpful is favoriting folders. So if you right click potentially something, maybe I'm working on 365 projects, I'm gonna hit add to favorites. It's gonna bring it to the top of my inbox. So if it's a folder that you've been using frequently, maybe you want to highlight it or draw your attention to it by creating it, by making it a favorite and then putting, allowing it to be at the top of your inbox. That's just something quick and easy that you can do. So favoriting folders. If you no longer need it anymore and it's become obsolete, you can right click again and choose remove from favorites and it will return it back to its space, its original space in your inbox. 
And then, last but not least, as far as inbox is concerned, I like to use what are called color categories. So if you're not familiar with color categories and you happen to be a visual learner, I am gonna show you what these are about. So you'll notice as I move down my inbox, there's a few emails here that have little rectangles of color next to them. And these rectangles of color correspond with a specific category. So let me show you. So I'm gonna right click on Pooja's email here. And if I right click and I go down to categorize, you can see that I've created multiple color categories. And these color categories, um, you can create however you so choose. Um, I'm gonna go to all categories to show you. But when you create color categories, you can assign them to your emails. And you can also assign them that I'm gonna show you in a little bit to your calendar events. So color categories are great because it allows you to filter your emails a particular way, which I'm gonna show you. It also allows you to have more um, direct searches within your inbox if you're looking for particular types of emails as well. If you wanna create a new color category, I'm gonna back up and show you how I did that again. I right click on this email, I go to categorize, and then I go to all categories, which will bring up this window to create categories. If I wanna create a new category, I just click new. I can title it, I give it a color. If you're really good with keystrokes, you could give a shortcut key so that you could just use your keyboard to label these emails. But then you can see these are all the color categories that I've created. So once you've created your color categories, if you are a person that likes to keep things within your inbox, this is a visual way of being able to organize that. If you go to up at the top by date, you have different ways in which you can filter your inbox. So I'm gonna to choose to filter it by categories. And then you'll notice when I scroll down here, it's now organized those emails based on the category. And you can see that my orange category is for consultation, my blue category is for training. In addition, I can search. So if I go up to the search, you'll notice I see some prompts pop up down here. If I go to search for categorized items, let's say I want to, um, I have uh, an event that is coming up and I need to search through all my emails and I don't have time to do that. I can go to my event category and it'll pull up all of those emails or reminders that I categorized as an event um, for to help me make sure that I don't forget about anything. And again, this pulls through for all folders. So I really like color categories because I'm a, a visual person when it comes to organization. So Stephanie, uh, just a quick question about that. I wanna mm -hmm. make sure that we are all clear on when you when you said um, like the events, you have them categorized as green. Mm -hmm. It will pull from all folders, not just the current inbox, right? When you are looking for events. Correct. Okay. Good. Yep. 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 Yes, it will. And actually, that's where I was just going to pause. So does anyone have any questions currently for as far as the few organizational tips that I've provided? All right. Yes. I have Dr. a question. I don't have, I'm Gabriella. I don't have that view of Outlook when I open it. I okay. have a simplified version. So let me just. Has, um, new mail, delete, report, move, flag, mark red, sync, and block. So I'm going to quick ask you. Did you open your Outlook application through your start menu? No, I'm using a Mac also, so. Okay, so that's gonna definitely change the view. Um, it, it also might be the case that you're in the new version, which is gonna be a little bit different. So if you want, um, we can connect after the fact, okay. um, and then we can kind of navigate that together okay. just Sounds for this. Good. Yeah, just because I'm running through it with Windows for yep. right now. Sounds All right. good. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for bringing it up. All right, cool. 
Well, then let's move into talking about managing automatic message content. So this is kind of um, where Outlook thrives as far as if you don't want <laughs> to have a very full inbox. There are some skills um, that Outlook provides that are going to be great if you are one um, to do a little bit of front loading. So first, let me talk about my templates. So if you are a person who tends to send the same emails over and over again, whether for status updates or events or reminders, my templates can be really handy and helpful for you. So how we use my templates is we need to craft a new email. So click on new email. Mine will pop up here. And I don't know, in your ribbon, underneath message, all the way to the right, you should see either the icon with view templates, just the paper icon with the lightning bolt. And what it does is it's essentially um, a way to save text that you can reuse over and over again. So again, like I said, if you need to email the same group of people every two weeks for a status update, or for me, an in-person consult reminder, I can click view templates. And you'll see that Outlook has provided you with some pre-made templates. Like for example, I'll reply later, or I'm running late, but you can create your own. Um, and how you do that is you come down to the little plus template button and you can title it and you can put in the text, whatever it may be, and it'll save it. So that way, when you wanna send out an email really quickly. And let's say I have a consultation reminder. I can go to my in-person reminder, click it. It's just gonna populate within the email and I don't have to go through the hassle of retyping every time the same email. And I also don't have to go to back to my sent mailbox to, to, to go and copy and paste um, the same email over and over again. So my templates is really handy that way um, to send a message that really doesn't need any modification. Sweet, yes. And I'm gonna give you another, this isn't uh, available to Mac users, but if you use my templates, you're also gonna print like what's called quick parts and quick parts you can utilize um, with my templates. So if you click in the body of the email and you go to insert, there's a piece that says quick parts and this is nice too, because it essentially does the same thing, but you can save things like links or images within your quick parts. So for example, if I have a template that says, hey, this is your in, this is a reminder for your in-person consultation, maybe I need to tell that individual directions for how to get to my office. And I've saved that as a quick part. So you can see directions in my office and I can insert that within the body of the email. But Quick parts, you can save anything. So if I have links in here or images and I wanna save it as a quick part, I just need to highlight all of this, go to insert, quick parts, scroll to the bottom and choose save selection to quick part gallery. And that will save all of that. You can title it that way. You just need to go to quick parts, insert it every time. Um, it's great for those things like presentations where you have slide decks or additional links or images that you don't want to have to go back and insert uh, manually. Quick parts, however, is not available to Mac users. So sorry for that. But my mm. templates. I'm going to pause there just before we get into rules because rules is kind of robust. Any questions about quick parts or my templates? All right. Just make sure I'm not missing anybody in the chat. Okay, so let's talk about rules. Rules are fantastic if you want to automatically file and filter incoming mail, which sounds great because then you don't have to be the person dragging and dropping into different folders. But there is a little front loading, which I'm gonna show you. So rules helps automatically manage incoming mail. So here's how this works. There's a couple of ways to do this. If you are new to rules, then I suggest using the quick way, okay, which I'm gonna show you. 
And then as maybe you become more confident with creating rules, you might want to move into the more robust way. So I'm going to show you both. So I'm going to go back to filtering this by date. All right. So I'm going to use an example. All right. Here's an example email that I've received. Uh, it's from Emil and it's sent to the IT only group. Okay. And let's say emails like this to me are somewhat important, but maybe I don't need to spend my time reading it right now. Okay. So I'm going to mark this on red. So it looks like it came in the email. So what I want to do is I want to create a, a rule that anytime I get an email from Emil and to the IT only group, it's just going to file it away into my IT updates folder. That way I don't have to look at it right now. I can look at it later. It's just going to not be clogging up my inbox. So what I do is I'm going to right click on this sample email and you'll see about a third of the way up, there's an option called rules. Okay, so there's a quick way you can do this. You can quick way do the filing by the sender or based on the recipient. So if I choose always move messages from Emil Delgado, it'll prompt me with all of my folders and I can choose, okay, anything that comes from Emil, I'm gonna put in the IT updates folder and then I'm gonna click okay. And then it's gonna disappear and you'll notice, oh, look, there's a new piece of mail in my IT updates folder. You can see by the bolded number one. But that way it doesn't clog up my inbox. It just goes into its specific folder. So right now the rule I just said was anything from Emil, please go to the IT updates folder. That's what I told Outlook. However, it might not be as basic as that. So I'm gonna bring this email back put it back in the inbox. And then I'm gonna show you the more robust way of doing this. So same thing, choose an email and go right click to rules. And we're gonna to go to manage, or excuse me, create rule. So create rule. And at first it's going to have a few basic um, conditions, but I'm gonna go I'm gonna bypass that and go to advanced options so you can see everything. So how Outlook sets up rules is first, it tells you step one, you need to choose the conditions that the email needs to meet. And you'll notice there's a lot of conditions. So this is gonna take some time for you to get acclimated with, um, but you find you start to use the same sort of conditions. So let's say the conditions I want this email to meet in order for this rule to apply is I want this email to be from Emil and I want it to be sent to the IT only group. So I want those two things to occur in order for it to filter this email a particular way. You'll notice when I select these conditions, they show up down here as I create the rule. If for some reason I wanted to modify who it was from or who it was sent to, I would just click on the text and I would choose basically anybody else who's an Outlook if I wanted to make that change. But for right now, I want this to occur. But you can see there's lots of different conditions. You could have emails be filtered by importance, by sensitivity, if there's specific words that show up in the text of the body. Um, you could say, again, if it's assigned to a category, um, there's so many options here, that, which is why this, you know, is going to take some time to kind of sift through at first. But those are my two conditions. So right now I'm telling Outlook, hey, I'm going to create a rule that has to occur when it's sent from a meal and it's sent to the IT only group. So now I'm going to click next and I'm going to tell Outlook what I want it to do with an email that meets those conditions. So now you've got a lot of actions that you can choose from. I can move it to a specified folder. I could assign it a category. I could delete it. I could send it to somebody else. Um, you could flag it. You can play, You could mark it as important. You could have a specific window pop up with a message. You have so many options. So for this, I want it to be moved to a, spe to a specified folder. And again, that can that action showed up down here, but I need to change specified to the folder that I want to choose. So I'm gonna click the text 
and I'm going to choose which folder I want it to go to. So now it no longer says specified, it says the actual name of the folder. And I think that I also want a specific message to show up, to pop up and alert me, why not? And I want it to say, email from Emil for fun. So now if these two conditions are met, it's gonna show up and alert me with a pop-up window that says email from Emil, and it's gonna go into that folder. So follow me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Last but not least, you have the option of creating exceptions. So let's say this is all fine and dandy, but what if the email, I don't know, is sent directly to me? Or what if my name shows up in the body of the text or something that I find more important? So let's say um, if it's sent only to me, then I don't want this rule to apply. I want it to stay in my inbox because I need to be able to read it sooner rather than later. So you can create exceptions, again, to those conditions that will then eliminate that rule occurring automatically. So now, and again, you have a lot of choices, so take some time to look at that. When I'm done, I'm gonna click next, and I'm gonna click run this rule, now on messages already in my inbox, turn this rule on, and then I'm gonna click finish. Now, I wanted to bring this up. Some of the conditions and actions that Outlook provides are only specific to the client, meaning this message will show up and it will tell you this rule will only run when you check your email in Outlook, which means if I don't have Outlook open, the rule won't run. And most of you are like, well, what's the point of having a rule if it's not gonna do it automatically? Well, we can fix that. We just have to get rid of either the conditions or actions that I chose that make it so that this is occurring. So some people, so I will tell you, um, if you Google conditions and actions that are client only, it will show up with a list of those because it's sometimes hard to remember what's causing what. So in this instance, the reason this happened, now it ran the rule, so I need to go back and you can see it's in the IT updates folder, but I'm gonna go back and modify this. So I'm gonna right click, go to rules, go to manage rules and alerts because I want it to run all the time. Now notice you can see when it's client only, it shows up with client only in parentheses next to the rule. I don't want it to be client only because I want it to run all the time, what, whether or not I have Outlook open. So I'm gonna go to this rule, I'm gonna open it up. And in this instance, the thing that is keeping it from running constantly is this action I chose of displaying a specific message. So I'm gonna uncheck that. I'm gonna click finish and you'll notice it no longer says client only. So again, if you're not certain as to which actions or conditions are causing it, um, my suggestion would be to Google client only actions and conditions for rules because it will show up with a list. Now, if you don't want the rule to apply anymore, you can do one of two things. You can delete it by using this delete rule button. Or if maybe you just don't want it to be applying right now, you can deactivate it by unchecking the box. Whatever you do, make sure you hit apply so that it saves it. So in this instance, I'm gonna delete this rule because I don't really need it. I'll delete that rule too. And then I'm gonna hit apply and then hit okay. Now, just as a disclaimer, deleting a rule does not revert the changes that the rule made. So if it filed a whole bunch of stuff, it's not gonna take it back once you delete a rule or deactivate it. So rules are really great for that reason. But like I said, it's a little bit of front loading. Once you get the hang of it though, your rules are all in process, then you won't see a whole bunch in your inbox. You'll just see the numbers next to the folders in which you've automatically filed things, if that's the way you want to set up rules. There are also rules for things like, let's say every time you get a particular email, you, you want somebody else, 
your coworker or whomever's involved in a project to be alerted at two. Well, you could have a rule that every time you get an email, it's also forwarded to that person. So you don't actually have to do the forwarding, things like that. So um, I'm gonna pause there. Cause like I said, rules are kind of robust. Does anybody have any questions on rules? Um, Stephanie, yeah, right. I know for the purpose of the people in the room, maybe, maybe they don't mm -hmm. have this question, but for those that might be watching online later, mm -hmm. can you, can you talk for a second about, you've mentioned client only, can you tell everybody what that means? Yeah. So what that means is if you are, if you have conditions or actions that are client only, it means those will only apply when you have the desktop version of Outlook opened on your computer. So the desktop application of Outlook. Thank you. That's what that means. So that means if you don't have it open, the rule will not run. And I find that fairly inefficient because, you know, I'm not going to keep Outlook open all the time and active just to make sure my rules are running. So yes, you would want to get rid of any actions or conditions that are inhibiting that. Is that clear? Is that clear? Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Yep. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, you're welcome. Good question. All right. Well then last but not least for uh, managing um, automatic message content is your out of office reply. Now I know many of us already might know how to do this, um, but I want to bring it up because we've just talked about rules. So if you want to create an automatic of office reply in your Outlook, um, you want to go to file and you're going to want to go to automatic replies. So it's going to pull up this window and it's going to ask, do you want to send them? Do you not want to send them? So if I were creating an out of office reply, I would choose send automatic replies and maybe I'm doing it for vacation. So I'm only going to send it during a certain time frame. And you can change your message uh, based on recipients inside or versus, versus outside of your organization. So if you want a different out of office reply to be sent to people who are outside of your organization, you can modify that text as you see fit. But there's one other thing I wanted to bring up. Now that I've talked about the rules down here in the lower left corner, you can also attach a rule to this, which is kind of cool. Let's say you are on vacation, but you're expecting a really important email from somebody that you, you want to be dealt with and you want to forward it to somebody else to be dealt with. You can create a rule that then based on that recipient, whomever it's from, will automatically forward it to somebody else in your department to be able to handle it, which I think is great. So instead of just saying in the reply, please forward or excuse me, please contact so-and-so, you could have that happen for individual specific individuals, which I think is kind of cool. Um, or you could, if you, you know, expecting a lot of junk, you can have rules that delete automatic automatically so that when you come back to your email inbox, you're not overwhelmed by all the emails you've received when most of them might not be of importance. So you can attach rules to your out of office replies, which I think is pretty nice. And it's not gonna be as robust as you can see here, which is kind of nice. Um, you've got move to, copy to, forward, reply options um, for the most part. Okay, well, then I'm not gonna do it. Thank you. Any questions regarding out of office replies? Okay, and hopefully that part isn't too unfamiliar. Well, let me come back to PowerPoint. Um, and again, the way in which you achieve this on a Mac is very similar, it's just, you know, sometimes the icons and the menu bar and things look a little different. So that's a great, yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. All right. 
So let's talk about scheduling meetings and dealing with the calendar. So scheduling meetings, again, can be daunting or it can be efficient and not so bad. So there's a couple of quick little buttons that you can use in Outlook, which are really handy when you're scheduling meetings. So one in particular that's handy is just the reply with a meeting button that some of you may or may not be aware of. Um, let's say you know, you've know you got a thread going and you want to include the individuals who are in that thread in a meeting. So what you can do is based on that email, you can go over to these three dots and you'll notice there should be a little calendar with an arrow icon that's a reply with a meeting button. So if you click that, it's going to pull up a window for creating a new meeting and it's going to include everybody that's in that thread and it's going to title the meeting, the title of the email. And it's also just going to include all of the content in that thread so that you can remember exactly what it was that that meeting um, is going to be discussing. So I like the reply with the meeting button because um, it saves me a little bit of time as opposed to going to the calendar, inviting all of those people and then titling it and maybe putting in notes about what it's going to regard. So reply with a meeting button found by using these three dots. So I like that part. And Stephanie, the with that particular feature, the email stays in the inbox. It doesn't go anywhere, right? Correct. Yep. We'll just have a meeting that'll show up on your calendar. And then when you pull it up in your calendar, you can then see the content of the email as well. And deleting the email will not um, get rid of that as well. So if you're like, okay, private with the meeting, has the content of the email, you can then delete the email. Don't be worried about it disappearing from the content notes of the scheduled meeting. All right, um, adding online meetings. Um, that is really helpful if we go over to calendar. Um, when you create a meeting, if you aren't familiar um, with the Zoom add-in, that is super helpful to be able to add to your meetings. If you don't have the Zoom add-in, right, you can go to get add-ins when you're back. It's usually in our, where is my, it's usually in the ribbon, but get add-ins, and then you can add the Zoom button here to your meetings. Now, one thing, um, you can also do is if you tend to be one who forgets to add Zoom meeting links to your meetings, you can set it so that Outlook automatically does it for you. If you wanna do it automatically, you just need to go to file and then we go to options and then we go to calendar and then down here under calendar options, you can click on add online meetings to all meetings. And then you can choose the meeting provider, whether you wanna do Microsoft Teams or whether you wanna do Zoom. So if I were to choose Zoom. Now, the one thing I caution you in this instance is it will add an online meeting to every single calendar event that you put in your Outlook calendar. So even if it's just like doctor's appointment or vacation, anything that you input in the Outlook calendar, it will add a Zoom meeting to. So if you don't want that occurring, then don't choose to automatically add online meetings. Instead, just manually use that Zoom button as you see fit. So. Stephanie, can you go, can you go back to for the sake of uh, everyone in the room and maybe the people watching online, show us again where you find the get add-ins. Yep. So if we go to change So file. If we go to file, where's my tools? Manage add-ins. So coming back, I'm going to file, manage add-ins. It's supposed to show up with Outlook. For some reason, I think it wants me to do it. 
let me go into Outlook. It pulls up your online version of Outlook, which it's not doing right now. It's for some reason giving me CDC, but all you need to do is go to File, Manage Add-ins, and you'll be able to see a list of exactly what's available. So I'm not sure why it wants to take me to this CDC centers. This is a the virus. <laughs> yeah, a virus, yeah. Yeah, well, there's my problem. It works <laughs> when I do it incognito window, but thank you for pointing that out. But otherwise, for the rest of us that don't have viruses, managing add-ins will get you to the list of atta attached applications that you can add to Outlook. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I'll have to get that settled after the word. All right. And then another handy feature is let's say you have a lot of meetings that kind of um, butt up to each other and you, know, you are rushing, you don't wanna cut the conversation short. You can actually set up um, for Outlook to end meetings early by default. So the way that you do this is if you go to file and you go to options, and again, if we go to calendar, here where it says shorten appointment and meetings underneath calendar options, you can choose to have meetings end early. So if you need a little bit more of a buffer time in between meetings, you can choose to end early or start late, whichever you so choose. But then if I do that, let's say if it's a shorter than an hour meeting, I want it to end five minutes early or one hour longer, 10 minutes early. Again, you can adjust this as you see fit. And then I click OK and I go to create a meeting. You'll notice here that my default half an hour has now changed to 25 minutes. Or if I change it to an hour, it'll say about an hour and it ends at 10.50. So it'll automatically change the times in there um, if you wanna do that. I know it's not too difficult for you to essentially make your appointment times that length, but that's an option. And if you don't wanna do that, then you can just go back and you can uncheck that option. So we're not shortening anymore. Okay, um, another just really helpful skill is if you're in your inbox and you wanna create a meeting really quickly from email, um, you can just take the email physically and drag it to the calendar icon and it's gonna pop up with a meeting. And again, it will have the content of the email, it will have the title of the email, the only thing that's different about this is that it's not going to uh, include the individuals. So you'll have to actually put the names um, of the people that you want in the meeting. This isn't including the person or the CC'd individuals. So I'll have to manually put that in as opposed to when I replied with a meeting, it included those individuals. So it's just a quick way um, to create a meeting from an email. Just click, drag it over to the calendar icon. So, yes, that's true. Thank you, Shelly. Brought up, you also have to change the date to match that of the meeting. Yes, so you can change that as well. So the only thing it really that really transfers is the title of the email and the content of the email. Everything else you need to uh, manage yourself. So, but again, just a quick option. Yeah, yep, exactly. Perfect. That's why I use the reply with meeting button instead, for sure. All right. Um, and then um, another helpful tool that many of us may have dabbled in a little bit, I don't, I'm not really sure, but is using scheduling assistant. Um, scheduling assistant is really handy for being able to create meetings without the back and forth of, hey, when are you available? When are you available? What you can do is if you go into the calendar and you create a meeting and title it, whatever you want it to be titled, 
and we want to invite various attendees. So let's say I want my boss to be there and Kyle, you can be optional. No, oh, you can be optional too. Okay. And let's say I want it to be an hour length meeting. What I can do is up here at the top, go to scheduling assistant. So what scheduling assistant is going to do is it is going to look at everybody's schedules um, pending. People are using their Outlook calendar, right? So pending people are using their Outlook calendar. This is a very effective tool. However, if people aren't using their Outlook calendar, it might present more of a problem. But if people can get into the habit of doing that, this is really handy. So you can see the attendees in here. Those are who are required. Those who I chose are optional. And let's say we can add a resource too, which could be a room. So let's go with KHS. So you can see, hey, I want to meet with these people. I want to meet at this location. When is everybody available? When is the room available? And you can see there's a key down here at the bottom. So if different people's schedules look different, um, the purple just means busy. Anything that is has diagonal lines is tentative, out of the office, working elsewhere, so and so forth, depending on how people input their information into their own calendar. But then what you can do is you can either continue to add attendees, you can refresh availability as well. And then in order to figure out exactly who is available, you can kind of scroll here and see when your schedules match up. So this is super handy Oops, in that way. Um, the other piece of this is, again, you can change the duration as you see fit. So let's just do, let's do 30 minutes. And I can kind of drag this in addition, if you would like to do that for being able to. So auto pick allows you to choose meetings based on required people. So let's say I really only care about the required people. When, when is the next meeting time that all the required people are available? And then you can see it move to this open space. Let's say I want all people and resources. Okay, well then that is the next available space um, of time for all of us. Or let's say I'm like, okay, well that's that's too late. I want an earlier time. If I hit earlier time, it will tell me, okay, well, based on the people that you chose and the room you chose, um, there is no earlier time, but that's an option. So you could keep doing all people and resources and keep clicking it and it will keep giving you alternative times. Okay. And if, again, if it's too late, you could go back and go to auto pick to earlier time. And then it'll tell me there isn't one available than what's selected. So I really like scheduling assistant. If you have the Outlook app on your phone, it's also really handy um, because you don't actually have to physically go into um, a meeting or a created event to be able to use scheduling assistant. It just kind of shows up um, with that feature if you go into the calendar. So I found that that's um, that's true. Only so yes and no. So I, as far as privacy is concerned, so. Um, if the reason I can see these individuals is because they've shared their calendars with me. Um, if you have other individuals, you know, it could be somebody who's, um, you know, hasn't shared their calendar with you per se. I can see, I can see Noah's and I can see Kyle's and Kim's events because they've shared their calendars with me. Otherwise it's just going to show up like this purple block. So unless that individual shared the calendar with you, you're not going to be able to see their personal um, calendar events and details. So I have that permission. Um, but if it's somebody else whom I've ever, who I've who I never corresponded with in G at GVSU and I go up and just try to use um, scheduling assistant to schedule a meeting, it's just going to show up as purple blobs. I'm not going to be able to see anything other than when they're available, just so you're aware of that. So um, I can see the 
I can see the details of these guys just because we have all shared our calendars with each other. So I wouldn't be um, just, I'm glad you brought that up. So you do not have to share your calendar with somebody in order to use scheduling assistant. However, if you did share your calendar, they could see the details of your events. So scheduling assistant is just great for block, for being able to see those blocks of time that are available to everybody. But again, it's pending, um, pending those individuals use their Outlook calendar to, you know, schedule time. So I like scheduling assistant and I really like it, like I said, on the um, Outlook app. So if you haven't dabbled in that, um, it's actually really nice and user friendly, very clean cut. I would I would recommend it. Any questions on scheduling assistant? All right. Well, then let's just wrap up. I mentioned color categories um, in the inbox, but you can kind of see I have a few colored um, events on my calendar. So I'm going to show you that the colors, they correspond the same way. So if I create an event, you have the option to categorize it. So if you go to options, oops, tags, excuse me, you can go to categorize and you can choose how to categorize the event um, or the meeting or whatever it is you want to do. Um, I think this is handy because again, it corresponds with your inbox as well. Um, and it just helps me. I know that when I've color categorized um, whatever it is in my calendar, it means I've, if, if somebody's invited me to something, um, I've seen it, I've acknowledged it, I've changed it to whatever category it is. And it's also really hand, handy, like I said, in doing searches. So for example, I had a meeting with my boss and she wanted to um, know exactly what professional development I've been involved in, in this year. And I have a color category for professional development. So if I go up here to the search menu um, and I go to categorize, um, I can search for professional development, PD, and it's gonna show up with all of the calendar events that, um, I categorize this professional development. So I can say, hey, this is what I participated in this year as far as professional development. And I have it listed because I've taken the time to just change the color of the event in my calendar. And once you get in the habit of doing that, um, it gets really easy. You can do, like I said, you, with rules, you can do that with emails automatically. Um, doing it on the calendar, you, you have to do it manually, but it's just a right click. Um, so I'll show you, like if I go to my calendar of events, it's just a right click on the event, go to categorize, and then after you created the categories, name it what it is. And that way um, you're able to quickly and easily uh, search for it if you need to. And it just looks kind of nice because um, then you just get in the habit of being able to see, oh, look, I have this many events this week. I have this many meetings this week because I'm seeing a bunch of blue or I'm seeing a bunch of green. Um, I really like for my own purposes, like the color um, categories. So, all right. So I'm going to pause there because that brings us to the end of our scheduling meetings. Time this fairly well. Um, what questions do people have on anything I've shown you today? Steph, I've got a question um, just regarding the um, where things are located. So the uh, vertical taskbar on the very left side of Outlook where the icons are, that used to show up on the bottom of my screen. Mm -hmm. Is, do we have any control over moving that back into the bottom or was that an update with a newer version of Outlook? Just one day it all went up there and um, I'd love to put it back down at the bottom if there's an option. That is a great question. I don't know because I don't remember where... I don't remember it being, are you saying in the new version when you switch to the new? No, tier? no, I'm, in, I'm not in the new version. I'm in, okay. I'm in the same one you were at in, in that vertical okay. um, where the calendar and the, and the mail icons are used to be on the very bottom ribbon. Right down here. Yeah. Um, my guess is that 
unless you can drag it over, probably not, but I'd have to, I'd have to investigate that, that more. I couldn't find a quick solution. So I was just curious if you knew. Yeah. I'm going to guess if it's been changed to there other than, you know, like for these where, you know, you can customize the quick access toolbar up the top and it gives you the option um, where you can show it below the ribbon. I think unless it has something like that available, which I'm not seeing it does, um, it's probably stuck where it is. Okay, thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Other questions? Anybody else? Well, hey, Stephanie, thank you so much. That brings us right close to the end of our time. So we appreciate you being here with us and everything yeah. that you're, you shared with us. Lots of nice uh, tips and tricks that we can maybe uh, start to utilize. Um, yeah. There's a lot going on with Outlook. So thank you for sharing and bringing us up to speed with some things we might be able to start using. You're very welcome. And thank you for inviting me. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out if anybody has questions. Um, I can connect with people individually. And uh, I hope that uh, I hope that I gave you a few things that you can utilize um, make things more efficient for you.